How many of you remember the game Tomb Raider? Oh, come on. I know more of you. Know. You don't want to admit it. Lara Croft was the only reason I played these video games. <laughs> Partly because she was beautiful. But the other part, she was so smart. When I met Carol Riley today, I didn't think of Laura Croft right off the bat, but when I talked to her, I was blown away. She is breathtakingly beautiful, not to marginalize her at all, but she is so smart. Carol is currently finishing her doctoral research in surgical robotics at the Johns Hopkins University, and she runs a laboratory called Tinkerbell Laboratory, which is focused on creating lovely, it says lovely right there, low-cost, do-it-yourself projects. She holds a patent on surgical skill evaluation and has been featured on PC Week, The Washington Post, NPR, and it goes on and on. Sadly, she's almost done with her graduate degree and she'll go back to California when she's done. Come, She won't be staying, I want you to make her feel real guilty. She won't be staying here in Baltimore, but boy, the work she's done while she's been here. Welcome, Carol Riley. Well, well, thank you, Anthony, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> and I'm extremely honored to be here today. Um, we've had some great speakers, and they've talked about the central theme, the future we make. So if you were to ask Hollywood uh, how they envision the future, it most likely includes robots. And I think that's great. Um, I, um, you could say, Carol, that's only the movies. It's not real. Um, but I think that the entertainment industry pushes us to think about possibilities. It lets us think about robotic design. And it gets us to question things that we normally wouldn't think about, about the future. So how do we design these robots? Uh, what type of robots do we want to even build? And how do humans and robots coexist together? So when I was growing up, my favorite TV show was The Jetsons. And who wouldn't love to have Rosie the robot in your home who cooks and cleans and also gives you logical advice about your personal problems? <laughs> so much like uh, the personal computer revolution um, that was back in the 70s and 80s, I feel like we're standing on the edge of the personal robotics revolution, um, where the idea of Having a personal robot in every home is in our near future. So I'm a surgical roboticist. Uh, there's a lot of different applications for robotics. I've uh, been really interested in working in teleoperated systems. So that means a humor, human would sit down at a master's console and control a robot, which is at a far off distance. You could boldly go where no human has gone before. Um, and you can think about this. Uh, in terms of lots of different things, I started off doing underwater and industrial robots at Santa Clara University. And then I went to go work at Lockheed Martin on space satellites. But by far, the most fulfilling application for me has been working on robots that go inside the human body. And so this is the Da Vinci surgical system, which we have at Johns Hopkins. Now, I'm fascinated with this idea of extending beyond the reaches of the the human body. Humans aren't perfect. We have weaknesses. And if we can combine human intelligence with robot accuracy and precision, we can have superhuman capabilities. You can think of this uh, for a surgeon. If you can be able to augment his vision through magnification or through, uh, through graphical overlays and augmented reality, uh, you can get rid of hand tremor reduction and have a steady-handed surgeon. In, it's not just the field of surgery that uh, robots can be applied. It can be applied to a huge number of applications. Uh, taking the underwater example, the deepest part of the ocean reaches uh, 11,000 feet, and that's at the Mariana Trenches off the coast of Japan. Humans are limited uh, to only go a couple hundred meters. So a deep sea scuba diver can only go 100 meters. The world record is at 330. That's only in that first bracket right there. So you can see that there's a huge area of unexplored territory that if we couple with robots, we can explore. 
So here's a video that um, the people up there are going to start. Um, and you can see that we've come quite a long way with robotics. You've got robots that can juggle. Um, is this not playing? All right. Um, well, we've got robots that can juggle and fold laundry. Um, and what's really been amazing has been that uh, this year, Google has come out with the autonomous car. And the video that that's, was supposed to play is um, the view of um, the inside of Google's car, where no human is controlling the steering wheel, and the car can drive safely, but kind of recklessly, around the streets of California. <laughs> it kind of does an extreme driving um, thing, so it's pretty cool. So how do I define a robot? So a robot is an intelligent agent that uh, can sense its environment and um, act on it. So you've got intelligence, sensing, and reaction. So if you want to build a robot, we're going to look at how humans do it. How do we interact with the world around us? We've got our five senses. Uh, we have sight, sense of, um, of hearing, taste, touch. Um, and so if you want to get these things into robots, you can add cameras for its eyes so that it can see. You can add force sensors uh, so that it can feel. And you can use artificial intelligence to get it to think. So I'm going to focus on the field of human and computer vision really quickly. Um, so humans are amazingly complex creatures. You've got um, eyes that can uh, tell you a lot of information about the world around you. But we're amazingly complex creatures. Half of our brain is devoted to visual processing. So don't believe me? You can think about all the optical illusions that you've seen. So you know that um, what you see is different than how you perceive that, uh, that scene. And vision is a very um, a passive interaction where you survey the scene. Haptics, on the other hand, which is the sense of touch in robotics, is an active interaction. Where in able to, to be able to feel things, you have to manipulate and change the environment around you. So, um, so how do you get a computer to see? You have cameras that uh, look at a scene, and you have a computer program that can be able to recognize objects and track them in space. Building on haptic devices, um, if you get a robot, um, these are different sort of input devices that you can have for haptics. Haptics, like I said, is the sense of touch in robotics. Um, you can have glove-like devices that can display force, or you can have a pen-like stylus that will uh, give you force feedback. You can also think about haptics in terms of temperature um, or vibration. So it makes the environment a lot more immersive. A different type of interaction um, would be through speech and communication. If you look at verbal versus nonverbal um, interaction cues, um, I think we, today we've talked about IBM's Watson, which has the world record for Jeopardy. Uh, so we know that robots are incredibly smart. But what I was impressed with with this system is the natural language, that it was able to really naturally understand what people were saying and be able to respond back as well. So now you've got robots that can see and feel and think. Um, let's talk about how to design a robot and what type of uh, robots we'd like to see. So a few decades ago, this idea of, of um, robots that we, if we design robots that look like us, um, we like them more. So you have an industrial arm, and the more and more it looks like us, the better we think it gets. Unfortunately, when you get close, very, very close to how a human looks, it starts to get into this idea of the uncanny valley, which is uh, where robots just look creepy. And, <laughs> and we've seen a lot of these. So it's gotten uh, 
robot designers to really reevaluate and think about how to design robots. And maybe the best way to go isn't to get to look like us, but maybe to go the opposite way and look at really cute uh, robots. <laughs> so um, if this video isn't playing, that's OK. Uh, so um, yep. So, um, so this is a robot which is, works at nonverbal communication. Uh, it bounces, and 90% of human interactions are nonverbal. So this robot looks at how humans interact with each other and tries to capture that, and it does research. It's used as a research platform for kids with autism. These are a few other cute robots that we have um, in research labs. Um, they've gotten robots that are trying to capture uh, emotions and display personalities. Uh, the now robot um, in the corner here, made by Aldebaran, is a robot that um, is used for RoboCup. It's where a bunch of robots get together and play soccer, so they work together for a common goal. <laughs> so we've seen a lot of robots, and still didn't answer the question, how do you get a robot into every home? How many of you guys have heard of iRobots Roombas and Scoombas? Great. And how many of you guys own one? Ah, well, you are an early robot adapter, and I like that. That's awesome. Um, and we're starting to see more and more startups just coming out, um, and there's not very few. There's a couple in Silicon Valley, Pittsburgh, and Boston. And I'd really like to see some startups happening here. So we're starting to see low-cost sensors. So I'm going to go back to the video game example. Um, the field of haptics came from virtual reality, and um, it continues on today in the video gaming world. This is the Nintendo Wii. Um, it's got low-level haptics. You can hold this controller, and it will vibrate when you interact with your environment. Now think about how interesting and immersive this environment can be if you have like your iPhone and you're able to feel different textures on it. Um, that would make it even more addicting and immersive than it already is. Um, uh, the other one um, gaming device that came out back in November is uh, the Microsoft Connect for the Xbox 360. And it is an amazing device because you no longer need to hold any sort of uh, controller because you are the controller. So it will track your hands and use computer vision um, to be able to track your motions and you can have an interactive uh, gaming experience. But the other interesting thing about it is that it's only $150. So we've gotten um, a huge underground geek culture uproar uh, of people buying these connects and hacking them. So for $150, you've got a lot of projects to do yourself. So if you can buy low-cost sensors, um, you have the Thingomatic that came out from MakerBot, where you can do 3D printing. Um, very impressive. Um, and you have this $30 Arduino board, which is a microcontroller. Um, you're able to make things in the comforts of your own garage, um, in your house, and you can actually build it. So it's very exciting. We've got a lot of different uh, hacker spaces in Baltimore. There's a huge community. There's three different ones, so um, it would be cool to check it out. So there's been a boost from uh, the Arduino boards. It was just announced last week that it will be incorporated into Google's uh, development framework for open source, um, open accessories for their Android phones. So that's going to be really exciting that they're using the Arduino board, and we're going to be able to see a lot of exciting new products from, uh, that you can use on your Android. So you've got, you kind of see how these things are all moving. You've got the iPhone or the, um, the mobile app space. You have the video games, and you have uh, the do-it-yourself makers all kind of merging together to work on this project of low-cost um, robotics. And there's, you could kind of see this underground movement, and the pieces are starting to fit together. And it's really exciting. So this leads me to my new venture, which is temp 
Tinkerbell Labs. It's uh, for people who like to make things and to tinker in machine shops, um, where the goal is to work on uh, global problems and think about innovative, low-cost solutions in the field of uh, kind of projects like do-it-yourself healthcare, if that's a thing, um, <laughs> and uh, robotics and environmental issues. So uh, one project that I'm excited about is, um, is an automated needle insertion project. This is, was geared for high schoolers, where they would have to automatically insert a needle into a grape, uh, which is embedded inside Jello. And this is looking at the problem of a tumor inside a patient. So you can kind of think how these high schoolers using the Lego Mindstorm, things that you can make at home, you probably have grapes and jellos, um, and you can start building these things and thinking about problems um, that can be applied into the real world. So, we're still a long ways off from um, a personal robot in every home, but we're getting there. There's a lot of work to be done. What I imagine is robots that are intelligent, low cost, and have a positive global impact. So this is the future that you and I can make together. Thank you. Great job. Oh, you give that to her.